Alrighty ho, good afternoon there. Welcome, Gabba. Um, super excited to have you today as a guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Um, I found out from you, I think I was following you on Twitter, and then um, you popped up on my feed, and uh, there was a, a video of you uh, making your own moisturizer. And I was like, out of beef tallow. And I was like, right. Uh, let me watch this. And then I watched it and I was like, okay, cool. I've got to get this lady uh, on my podcast because um, <laughs> you are doing some really cool things. Um, I was wondering, how is the the moisturizer going? The moisturizer is going amazing. So I locally source beef fat and then I render it and then I make moisturizer. And what's so cool, actually, I was on the beef tallow moisturizer train today because I have a family member who has been struggling with eczema, like they were on hardcore steroids, taking it every day. It was extremely bad. And I was like, let me just send you this moisturizer. I know it sounds weird using beef fat, but I messaged them today and I was like, hey, how's uh, how's the tallow working? And they were like, it's it works really great. I'm only using my medicine once a month instead of daily. I was wow. like, that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well done. That's amazing. Um Wow, I must actually. I've got some friends that that also struggle with eczema. I must I must mention that to them because yeah, it sounds like a bit of a miracle. <laughs> it is because you know those steroids they just they make your skin worse. At least I think so. So then you're addicted to it, and then your withdrawal when you stop using it is so bad. Or as beef tallow builds up on your skin, I could talk about it all day. I think it's it truly is a miracle medicine for people, and it's sad when people have to struggle with something that can be like an outward um, appearance. So yeah, I'm happy to help. <laughs> can, can you maybe just explain a little bit more why like it is so good? Well, so beef fat, it has like the molecules that can go into your skin, like penetrate it. It's natural. You don't have like these, I look at it as like chemicals. You got this big pharma thing. And I look at it as like just this entity that wants you to stay addicted. Whereas you have this like natural from the earth, holistic medicine that is coming in, you need to have the beef tallow that is like grass-fed. It's also, the quality is gonna depend on what they're eating. If they have a junk diet, they're being fed a lot of grain just to be like fattened up. The tallow isn't gonna be as high quality, but it's so cool because tallow, the more you use it, the more your skin gets accustomed to it. And I'm looking at my skin right now as I'm thinking about it, because when you put it on, it's kind of like thick and can be kind of greasy. But the more you use it, the more it absorbs and your skin gets used to it. And it kind of just like, I don't know, works in cohesion with your skin, I would say, compared to like, I don't know, a chemical steroid that you're putting on and it's just masking the problem, not really fixing it. Yeah, it's amazing um, what that industry kind of does to us. It kind of, it sort of perpetuates uh, their involvement in our life because, you know, they they don't want you to kind of get better, but they'll give you a cure but it just kind of keeps you needing um medicines or creams or whatever so you keep on paying them and and yeah making them richer and richer so yeah i love the i love the beef tallow idea and and you've also made a sunscreen if i'm right because that's one i definitely want to try yeah so i have done a homemade sunscreen which is with a non-nano zinc oxide, which is what is going to protect you from the sun. And then it's non-nano, so it doesn't like get absorbed into your skin. Um, I actually don't use sunscreen anymore, but if you are going to, that's what I would use. And you can put beeswax in it. And I mean, I'm going to start making tallow sunscreen. So just doing my tallow recipe, experimenting with the non-nano zinc oxide, because I'm like, man, this is so amazing for your skin. Why not? try a sunscreen for people who want to use sunscreen. But yes, I, that's another thing. You look at those sunscreens that are on the shelf and yeah, that's another big pharma product. I would say that is just so bad for you. And a lot of people don't realize it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think a lot of the ingredients on it are actually carcinogenic from what you hear, uh, which is pretty worrying, you know, and you're putting it on the, the biggest organ of your body, which is then sucking it up and doing whatever it does with you. And yeah, it's, uh, it's concerning that people aren't aware of that. Yeah. And then you think of like the little kids where parents are just lathering their kids in this chemical goop when instead, if you're just like naturally taking your time to acclimate to the sun, but also I've noticed I've stopped sunburning because I've been eating like a natural local diet full of like lots of berries and antioxidant rich foods. And 
eliminating seed oils. And so that's another thing. It's it's masking the real problem, the sunscreen, and we're making these people richer when we can just take care of the problem ourselves. And I've posted about that online and there's so much pushback because the the programming of that we need sunscreen, I mean, has been entrenched in us since we were little, little. So like you're saying, our biggest organ and we're putting it on these kids, like just imagine their systems being overwhelmed with all these chemicals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I recently had a, a guest on my show. His name is Darren Olin, and uh, he's just written a book called Fatal Convenience. And it's all about the toxins that are in our everyday product. Uh, sorry, in our in our everyday environment. And wow, it's pretty scary. Like the amount of chemicals that are out there. Um, he says something like there's eighty thousand new chemicals introduced into our environment every single year and only 1,500 maybe are tested. Um, and then they're only tested individually, right? They're not tested like with other products. So it's like, how do you even know what these things are doing? It's it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty scary. Like, you know, what they, they kind of almost doing to us. It feels like we're a bit of this a human experiment. That's for sure. Oh, I completely agree. I feel like that, like you're saying, like every day I kind of discover something where it's like, oh, that's actually chemical and not bad for me. But I've been told my whole life it was it was good for me, like the sunscreen. And like you're saying, we kind of are just these human experiment experiments. But then I think like there's only so much you can do, right? Because it can be overwhelming. You start to see the system for what it is. And, you know, sunscreen's toxic. Pasteurized milk isn't great for you. All these things that we were told were great for us actually are not. So it's just kind of, you know, can be a burden. So I feel like you just got to do your best. And that's really all you can do. And if you start stressing out about it, then stress makes your system overwhelmed more. So but yeah, our systems, like our environments are completely just full of those chemicals and toxins. Yeah, yeah, it's really crazy. Um, So Gabba, you've, you've, uh, recently, I think in the last few years, moved onto this amazing uh, 38 acre farm, and uh, it looks really incredible. Uh, but it and it just like I've obviously done a lot of research on you know on you just through your YouTube videos and your podcast and blog and everything like that. And it sounds like your childhood was actually quite different to the life that you're living now, like whereby you, um, I don't know, I'm assuming you might have lived in the city. Um, you didn't really have any access to sort of animals and pets and um, yeah, life sounded like completely different to what it is like now. Yeah. Yeah. You have that right. It was completely different. You had the city, but also my diet was so different. I feel like my parents' generation was probably the most entrenched in the uh, the food industry of, you know, you don't do butter. I remember one time my parents got the, I can't believe it's not butter when I was little. And I still remember thinking like, oh, this tastes horrible. Like my body is like not wanting it. Um, and so I grew up with a different diet than I'm eating now and still trying to recover from that. I feel like didn't grow up with any farm animals, knew nothing about farms and how they worked. I was so disconnected from my food. Uh, we didn't grow up with a uh, with a garden. We, you know, were dependent on the grocery store. And I'm not blaming my parents or that generation. I just feel like they were so bombarded with all of the propaganda. So that was, you know, what they grew up with. And their parents were coming out of it. So my great grandparents homesteaded. And my grandparents, you know, kind of got introduced to the grocery store and then my parents' generation really got hit with it. So when they were raising me, that was the best that they knew, you know, the grocery store and you don't have farm animals. And so, yes, I grew up completely different. But when I started seeing, you know, the reality of the things that really hit me in 2020 with um, <laughs> the pandemic and going to the grocery store and people were fighting over food, the, the shelves were completely empty. And I was just like, wow, we are, there's such a big disconnect and that's kind of what catapulted me to my life now. And it sounds like there was also kind of a movie that you watched when you were a little bit younger in, in middle school that also got you all thinking a little bit differently in terms of like what's going on with the food. Was that, uh, was that the vegetarian video that I talked about? Yes. So, oh, I am ashamed to say, but yeah, I watched a vegetarian, like a, a 
propaganda. There was a celebrity, I think some celebrity talking about, you know, you need to be vegetarian and meat is so bad and these animals are in horrendous conditions, which yes, absolutely meat industry, meat industry, um, mass meat industry with how they treat animals. I am not on board for that at all. And so that's why I shop local. I'm a huge advocate for sourcing local. You're going to see the quality in your diet. You're just night and day difference, but I got hit with that at a young age. And so I went vegetarian for a long time, for a very long time in my life, about a decade. And yeah, I am so sad, but I finally came around to the truth of meat and why it is so vital to have. I was listening to a podcast and there was a dentist on there and he was like, I can always tell when somebody's vegan when they come in because their gums always bleed. And that just resonated with me because I took immaculate care of my dental, but every time I went into the dentist, my gums bled. And so I just, that got me thinking. And I started to do more research and listen to these recovering vegans and vegetarians talking about how they were having back issues because, you know, their bone was eroding and their tissue was eroding. And I just really dove into the truth of it and started to see the propaganda that hit me when I was young. And I realized, nope, I don't support the mass meat industry. I think animals are spiritual creatures. We have the responsibility to tend to them and to care for them. And so that is why I was like, all right, I feel okay going to local farmers, seeing the animals in the pasture, and now I eat meat. So, oh man, yes, I got completely hit with that propaganda young. And it's so easy, right? Because I can totally relate. I mean, I'm from South Africa, right? And and we eat meat like it's, you know, you know, coming out of your ears sort of thing. Um, I mean, one of our one of our sort of um, traditional delicacies is a thing called biltong, which is like dried uh, beef, and it, it's it's kind of like beef jerky, but probably about two hundred times tastier <laughs> and better, right? Um, but you know, that's kind of what we grew up with, you know. And and then I uh, I lived for a long time in the UK, and then while I was there, I, I became as far as I was thinking a bit more like conscious, and you know, like. Um, I don't know what the right word is, but like, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And I started watching these, the same sort of movies and stuff. And I was like, no, I must also, yeah, I must stop eating meat. And I, you know, I must be, and I also went a vegetarian for about six months to a year, I think. Um, and you know, it's easy to get sort of, um, hooked on those propaganda movies, isn't it? You know? Yeah, it is like, especially too, you think about young kids and how impressionable they are. And so I feel like they're really hitting that young generation of um, you got to do what's right. And so you got to be conscious, you got to save the climate. And so these kids, I mean, my generation too was being hit with, oh, you got to stop eating meat. What are you doing eating meat? You got to, you know, go green. That was another huge one I was being hit with back in the day. So (laughs) It's crazy. It's just crazy to think that it's on all levels. They're trying to hurt our health. And I'm just glad that I finally saw the truth of that. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad as well. Um, there's, there's an amazing uh, documentary. It's called the biggest little farm. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen it or not. You know, I feel like I may have, it sounds familiar. The biggest little farm. Was there also a book that goes along with that too? I don't think so. Um, it's the anyway. It was this this couple in California. They, I think he was a, a movie director. Um, I'm not too sure what his wife did, but they bought a like a 250 acre uh, piece of land, and um, he decided he was going to like film their sort of uh, journey. And um, wow, it was such an incredible um, like documentary. And uh, you know, you really got to understand the sort of ecosystem. And how everything has a role, but also like the necessity of having like plants and animals and everything kind of working together. Otherwise, the ecosystem just kind of destroys itself. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And that that does sound familiar. I maybe have seen clips from it maybe on TikTok or something, but I I see that just kind of what you're talking about. So I have cows grazing on part of my property right now. And then another part of my property is monocropped, right? So everything was taken out. They planted a monocrop and you can just see the difference. Like the, when they go in and they monocrop it, all these animals die, you know, the voles and you have the gophers and everything that gets taken out. 
but where the cows are grazing, everything is living in synchron, like in um, together, and things are work. You know, it's just beautiful compared to like that mono crop where it just isn't really natural. So yeah, I see that. Yeah, it's amazing. And like one of the things that they needed to do, like before they could almost begin anything, was to uh, recover the soil. And this is such a huge issue, I think, in uh, today's society is the the healthiness of our soil. Oh, yeah, it definitely is. Think, and a lot of people don't think about that. Like our soil is just being degraded. And especially with the monocrop culture that we have going on, because it's not natural, the soil is not able to regenerate. And so I am trying to be conscious of that when I let people come in and farm part of the property. And I do not let any pesticides, nothing hit my land. And I'm also looking into figuring out like crop rotation and all that sort of thing. I use, I have them use natural, like organic, they're using chicken compost. So I'm trying to be uh, thoughtful of that because yes, I want to carry on, you know, carry on the soil to my family and so important. Are you finding it possible to have a functioning farm without using uh, like say pesticides and other chemicals um, to, yeah, to make things flourish? Yes. Yes, I do. I think it's absolutely doable. And I just feel very blessed where I'm at. I feel like I'm in a pocket where I'm not having a lot of pests. I'm not having a lot of problems. So I can see why people would maybe want to go that route. I personally would never. Maybe you get a higher crop return. And for me, absolutely. I don't use any sort of pesticides, herbicides. No chemicals touch my farm at all. Yeah, because ultimately, you know, that stuff then goes into your system and yeah, I mean, it's uh, some of those things like glyphosate has just got serious, serious consequences that I think people have no idea about. And, um, you know, it's also also quite a big concern. Yeah, and I, I was sitting there thinking, you know, on the pesticides and herbicides, what is it, Roundup? I remember growing up and my dad using Roundup in the yard. And now I think about it, my yard is so full of dandelions come spring because dandelions are so healthy for you. So heart healthy, you can make teas, jellies, and they're the first food uh, for the bees when they come out of spring here. And so I just think of like this air system, they tell you to use this uh, herbicide to kill something that's so beneficial for the bees. And then they say, oh, the bees are declining. Well, I wonder why, because we're poisoning them and people don't even realize that because they're not putting together what they're doing on their lawns and what, you know, um, plants they're taking out that is a food source for these beneficial animals like bees. Just a sort of side side thing here, like you, when you said dandelion, it reminded me back in the day. I used to I used to do bodybuilding, right? And and one of the supplements my my coach would give me was a dandelion, and um, I'm trying to remember now exactly what it was. I think it was actually to help make me wee, so that I could um, get sort of as much urine out of me as possible and dehydrate myself. I don't know if that sounds right. So I'm just making up stories there. <laughs> no, that does sound right. Yeah. Um, it's so cool to hear that you used it as a supplement. I, I love to, um, I, I make tea out of it. I make jelly and then I also dry them and then make like an oil infusion and then I'll put it into like tallow balm. So. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. Hey, like how one plant can have so much use. Um, I, I was busy, uh, my wife and I are actually busy looking to buy some land because we want to start uh, growing, I think it's called flax plants, which um, is what hemp is made from. Um, and like, you know, you can, that, that's like such a, hemp is such an amazing, sorry, not hemp, what, what um, I'm talking rubbish here, what linen is made from. <laughs> Hemp's obviously made from, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, it's what linen is made from, right? Um, so, yeah, but it's just amazing, like what you, what you can do with certain plants um, and, and the usage, if you think of like a coconut tree, like, I mean, what they get from a, like a coconut tree, you can literally use the whole thing. Um, and uh, it's just amazing. I can imagine you've learned like so much about different plants with everything that you're doing. Yeah. And I feel like that is going to be like a localized thing, right? Because you're talking about coconut and I couldn't even dream about having coconut here. Um, and 
So I kind of have that localized what's growing here, but that's so interesting to think like going to grow linen, would you make like clothes out of it or like what would be your goal? Yeah, that's exactly it. Because what I've um, heard recently uh, is that uh, different um, sort of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like te- uh, what, uh, fabrics, right? I guess yeah. Yeah. have different energies. Okay. Yeah. And things like, uh, cotton, things like polyester um, have a negative energy. But when it comes to linen, uh, linen has like a like a, a five times positive kind of energy. Like, and, and this is something that obviously rests on your body all day. Um, it was really like an amazing, this is once again, this is like old knowledge. Do you know what I mean? And, and it was a really amazing thing that I watched. And I was like, wow, I always liked linen. It's like a nice material, isn't it? You know, and um, it sort of can keep you cool in the summer, but in the winter as well, can actually feel quite warm. Um, so yeah, it would definitely be to to sort of make clothes. I don't know if I would make the clothes or I'd just sell the kind of material, but but it definitely it's uh, it's because um, of the, you know, well, one, the fashion industry is a huge um, polluter of the world. Um, and if we can change that using like, you know, things like linen or hemp or whatever, um, then, you know, we're, we're at least po- positively contributing to to how things turn out. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I feel like maybe I've seen something similar to you because I was just reading about, I think they were talking about the frequencies of what we're wearing and how that affects us. And I think it even goes biblical. Somebody was talking about that. And so I've been slowly also trying to transition my clothes to linen for that reason. Because you think about it, yeah, it rests on your body. How is it affecting me? And I very much feel like you can uh, like feel those vibes and that sort of thing. So why would you not want to fill your life with the most positive, best vibes you can. And like you said, it is like an ancestral knowledge. I feel like all this ancestral knowledge has gone out the window and that's what, you know, the system has wanted because then we become a docile generation. We're dependent on others for our clothing and our food and docile is easy to to control. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. It was frequency. That's actually what they were talking about when it came to the clothing. Um, I was uh, I was just wondering you you where do you get like your sort of knowledge from in terms of what you're doing because I mean you're doing well one you're doing a hell of a lot of things um, and it's not necessarily like um, you know I guess widely known some of the stuff that you're doing but like where do you sort of do your research and information gathering for you know things of the farm. Uh, things like your food storage, all these sort of things. Is it, is it knowledge that's passed down or you research it somewhere else? So it's actually a mix of both. So my biggest inspiration is my great grandparents. So they immigrated from Romania, Czechoslovakia, and they came out and they started homesteading here in America. And they grew enough food to feed their fam- their family and 12 kids throughout the whole winter. So I have been tracking down like their recipes and how they did it and listening to stories from my dad because he got to spend some time with them. And so that's been my inspiration. Like, okay, so they, you know, they canned, like what else were they doing? What did they grow in their area? And because their area is similar to mine, but I've also, I have been tracking down knowledge from community. So I am so, so huge on community, like the local farms. Whenever people reach out to me and they're like, somebody just reached out to me the other day, I think about what kind of plants to grow or tomato plants to grow in their area. And I say, you got to go and find somebody who is gardening locally because they're going to know the best. So I have been good about making connections with different farmers who have different specialties. So I knew somebody who was doing goats two years ago and I just got goats. So Um, they have kind of become a mentor and I'm taking these bits and pieces of knowledge. And uh, my dad actually got me a homesteading book. It's like this big, thick, everything you need to know about homesteading. So it's been a great reference for me, but community, I feel like the community aspect has kind of been broken up. Like humans are tribal in nature. And now we're so dependent on, you know, the system that we've kind of forgotten that our neighbor might have knowledge or something that we could barter for and trade for. And we've kind of lost those skills. So community has been such a wealth of information for me. Like when I got my dairy cow, learning from people who have cows, 
Um, so kind of working together with my community, my neighbors, and that's where I'm really growing in my skills and also trial and error, just getting the animals, figuring out what they need, going out there. So it's been a mix of all that. Sometimes that's the best way, isn't it? Is literally taking action and, uh, and learning yourself like on the ground sort of thing. Yeah, it absolutely is. Because if you don't get your hands dirty or you're like kind of scared to, you're never going to learn. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I must say you uh, are like a very inspirational uh, young lady, that's for sure. I mean, everything that, uh, that you are doing um, for me takes a, a lot of bravery, right? And, you know, courage. Uh, I wonder, is this something that's kind of like intrinsic to you? Have you, have you always been that type of person? You know, I feel like I always have. I've always been, you know, growing up when I was a teenager, I had a piece of paper on my ceiling that I would read every day that had like my goals and I was always just striving for them. But now it's almost be become kind of a spiritual aspect to it where um, I want to get on and I want to share good messages for people because I know that the world is so, it's kind of getting dark now chaotic, I would say. And so I feel like if you can build a community online, like you can reach so many people. Um, so I feel like it's kind of been natural for me, but now it's, it's really just kind of has a spiritual aspect to me for me. Do you, do you feed off the, the community vibe? Like now that you, you know, you built yourself up a, a really great following, like, is it something that you, that gives you energy yourself? Oh, yeah. So it's so interesting that you say vibe because there totally is a vibe even on online presences. And it's really cool because like I'm talking about how there's a community of my neighbors and people locally. There's also a community of people online who want to learn like somebody reached out today asking me about chickens and I'm able to share resources with them. And so I'm becoming a resource and hopefully an inspiration for people to see that you can homestead from anywhere. I really want people to just regain that power that I feel like we've lost in just a few generations. Like I know people can do it. You can do it from anywhere and you don't need land to do it. You definitely do inspire people and motivate people. Uh, I was like talking to you, um, talking about you uh, to my wife and I was saying, you know, cause we've actually got a, a decent sized piece of land um, in Portugal where we're meant to be living. <laughs> we're obviously not there at the moment, but um, we are also going to be, uh, you know, growing our own food and, um, you know, hopefully having a, like a, you know, a few chickens and that sort of stuff. And I was like, you know, what Gubba is doing online is amazing. You know, you just have to look at your, uh, your YouTube and you can pick up like so many amazing tips and pieces of advice from you. And then like on your website as well, you have like how to do's, you know, like download this PDF. And I think that's just so amazing. So, you know, I'm not surprised that, uh, that you have people reaching out because, you know, you're doing like something at a really high standard as well. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, extremely helpful to everybody. So, so well done. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And it's, it's a good reminder because I kind of just go through my day thinking, oh, you know, it's just a part of my day. Maybe it's mundane, but there might be somebody out there who wants to learn more about chickens or more about food storage. And so I am so happy to be helping people. I just want people to learn and know that they have that power. You mentioned that, uh, the world feels like quite heavy and, and dark. Um, I, I, I do agree. Um, but I do have a lot of faith, like in the human spirit myself that, um, you know, there's a, there's a nice awakening that seems to be going on at the moment. Um, I think there's many people say like yourself that are going like, actually you not, know I should start maybe growing my own, um, own food, um, or, you know, at least looking for, for food that's more local to me or going to farmer's markets or something like that. Um, you know, th there's obviously in the financial world, there's a move away, you know, into the decentralized space of everything, you know, where, and, and in our own system, there, there's, everything has been centralized, you know, for, you know, for a long time now, but there seems to be a breakaway where, you know, things are becoming more decentralized. So even things like the media, you know, like the media is almost like, uh, just old school now, you know what I mean? Like you, you just take a guy like Joe Rogan, for example, you know, he, his podcast has something ridiculous, like 
a hundred times the amount of people that listen and watch his show, just one of his shows that kind of CNN gets in a month, for example. So that my faith is that this kind of decentralization of information, of finance, of knowledge is going to just, you know, grow us up much, much stronger now and, and build stronger communities um, you know, so so yeah, in the old school way of doing things, they're holding on to it by like, you know, the sort of ends now. But uh, I think my, my faith is that we will overcome this. I like that. That is like really inspiring because I feel like there is something in that human spirit where, you know, we want that freedom and just that realization of community and how powerful community is. I feel like we've forgotten about that, but you're right. Yeah, it's it is bubbling to the surface and people are starting to see like, oh, I should grow my own food. You are absolutely right. You got into homesteading um, by all sounds of it uh, by through um, food storage. Um, you, you kind of like started doing like um, food storage and um, that then ultimately got you into homesteading. I was wondering if you could maybe just explain a little bit about what homesteading is and then um, how did like food storage get you into it? So this is what I would say homesteading is. I think homesteading is learning how to be self-sufficient. So part of self-sufficiency is, you know, you're able to take care of yourself. You're nourishing yourself. You're trying to grow your own food, finding areas for that. I didn't start out growing my own food. I had a little bit of a garden, not quite to the extent that I have now. And I was also, I would say homesteading is that community aspect. It is, I feel like community truly is everything, but I started homesteading because, well, you know, we had the weirdness of 2020 the shelves were completely empty. And I was just like, yeah, I, this is a fail of a system. I am never going to depend on a system like this again. Why would I ever put um, myself in the hands of the system and not be able to eat? That makes no sense. My grandparents would be, a great grandparents would be so ashamed of me. And so I started by finding a local farm and I started sourcing my eggs there. So that was kind of like my big community jump. I got to know these farmers who were selling eggs. And it actually, the farm store was down the road for me, which was really cool. And then I started to source out raw milk because that was another thing that I realized, oh, wow, pasteurized milk is actually not great for me. What am I doing? Raw milk. Wow, I've been brainwashed. So started just these little things. And then, so that was even before 2020, but it really hit me standing in those empty uh, stores. And so I started to build up a food storage with canning. So learning how to can, like my great grandma did, my dad said in their cellar, he just walls of canned food so they could feed their family. So that was a big inspiration for me. But I think homesteading really goes back to being self-sufficient and being able to rely on yourself and not rely on the system. And that's why I tell people, you can do that from anywhere. You don't need 38 acres of land to do so. Maybe if you want a cow, but the thing is you could go find a local farmer who's selling great quality meat that would be the same as if you had a cow. And plus you don't have to deal with the feed and rotating pastures and you can source your stuff locally. So that's what I would say homesteading is. Anybody can do it. Yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. Yeah, definitely uh, not everyone's going to have access to such an amazing piece of land like you, that's for sure. <laughs> and um, it's definitely not easy either, that's for sure, to to do what you're doing. Um, I can imagine your your days are 24-7 chock-a-block full, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, they definitely are. <laughs> so just like, when I just want to talk a little bit about the food storage and canning and stuff, um, and maybe like a little bit about fermentation as well like when it comes to to canning um like what are you actually using to preserve the food in the can like you know people i guess you know people like uh, or maybe you're kind of worried about what is like the lining of the cans do you can you get like things that that are not toxic um what do you do so i use glass jars and then uh the ball canning lids there are like reusable lids and other sort of options that you can look into but in regards to the are you talking about like chemicals on the lids so I really haven't even dove into that I guess chemicals on lids I haven't seen anything I guess if you would want to enlighten me if you knew any knowledge of that no I don't have I don't have but I mean 
Mm. These are things that I kind of know do kind of exist, you know, like, I, I mean, so I was, uh, the lids definitely, there's, there's something on there. If you, if you see sometimes like there's almost like a plastic lining on them. So there's, there's something there for sure. Um, I was actually talking about like metal cans, but you make, you use glass. So that's different. So, so that's also, that's good to know. So glass is the way to go. Um, but what do you use then to sort of preserve the, the food in it? Well, so it's going to just depend on what exactly you are canning. So for example, I made, I made these canned beef stew meals. So I did beef, onion, carrot, and then you can cover it with like a broth or water. And then you put on the lid and then you put it in your canner. And then depending on your elevation, that will be how long you, um, or actually how much weight you use. There's water bath canning and then there is pressure canning. So mainly it's just water. If you make jams, you just put the jam in and then put it into your water bath canner. So it's surrounded by boiling water. And then in your pressure canner, uh, you use like a little weight that you put on your pressure canner and it'll bring it up to pressure. And um, then the heat will sterilize everything. And you just have to make sure that your lids are sealed. But yes, I use glass. I would not use like traditional cans because of what you're saying, the chemicals. I believe that's going to be like BPA and other things that are going to leak into that. I wouldn't I wouldn't mess with that myself. But um, in regards to cans and food storage, that is a great way if somebody is starting a food storage to go to the store. And, you know, if there are canned beans on sale to get a few extra beans, I advocate for you get what you eat but also like shop sales. And that is just a great way if you don't have access to being able to can your own food. But yeah, canning is mainly um, like I'm going to be canning green beans this week. And I just put the green beans in the jar, cover them with water and then put them in the canner. So it's not crazy. But how long will that last? So um, it will last as long as it is sealed properly. So you have the jar and then you have the lid and you when you take it out of the canner you will test the lid by holding onto it making sure that it doesn't uh, come off or anything that has a full seal you hold onto it just by the lid right here and you make sure that there's a little indent that it's pushed in if it's out if there's anything wrong you want to eat that food immediately and whenever you do food storage checkups, make sure that everything's still canned properly. And so that's the general rule. As long as it still has the lid on and there's no buckling, which means it's like bubbled up, it doesn't look funky, then it's still good. But I, what I really like to go by is when I open it, does it look okay? Does it smell okay? Because I feel like we have these senses that, you know, our ancestors used to be able to determine if something was bad or not. Um... So that is what I use. And I know some people will also go by the one year rule, but in my experience with canned food, as long as it looks okay, smells okay, there hasn't been anything that has inhibited the seal, it's going to be okay. Do you ever use anything like salt or lemon to preserve it for a bit longer? Yes. So uh, lemon, that will bring up the acidity. So like when I do canned tomatoes or when I'm canning salsa, I will use lemon, but also add in salt uh, for seasoning. So when I can my greens, I'm going to put in some salt because it's going to be hard to season after they've already been canned. But yeah, I will put in about a teaspoon of salt per quart jar. And it also depends on what my what I'm canning. I also put in salt if I'm canning beans. And you can do a mix of seasonings. I prefer to season uh, mostly after, you know, I take out the beans and put into a chili and then I'll season. So yes, I do use both of those. And it will depend. So water bath canning is for high acid foods and then pressure canning is for the low acid foods. And that's why with tomatoes, you use the lemon to bring up the acidity. It's so interesting, um, and I hope that uh, everyone that is listening or watching the show like uh, goes and checks out your your YouTube channel um, and and your your website too because you do uh, post a lot of information um, on there which which people find really helpful. You know, because sometimes just listening to someone explain things is you know is, it's a little bit difficult to follow sometimes. So please just go and um, and check out Gubba's stuff. Um, just fermentation. Uh, I actually, I actually studied uh, uh, quite a while ago now to be a, sh uh, a chef, 
and um it was it was around it was being like a health chef like a healthy chef should i say uh, and one of the one of the things that we did was around fermentation and um there's i mean it's amazing what you can actually do you know just with a little bit of salt effectively you know some some of the times you know and and different vegetables um you know sauerkraut is such an easy thing to to make um which is i guess a combination of like canning and ferment, fermenting and then um uh, you know, kimchi is something really, really kind of tasty and, and has a bit of a, a sort of nice spicy um, hot, hotness to it. Um, what sort of things are you fermenting? So right now I do kefir, which is like a fermented milk. Um, you get these kefir grains and then you uh, train the milk to ferment it. And it kind of becomes like a yogurt, but it's just full of good bacteria. You can use it in your smoothies. I, I just use it as yogurt. I love it so much because yogurt most of the time is pasteurized, devoid of everything. And they have to add, back, add in the bacteria back into it. Whereas kefir, I have my source of milk for my goats. And then I just put the, the milk in there. And with my kefir grains, and then it will become thick uh, about a day, depending on temperature. And then I just get this kefir. So that, and I know sourdough is also considered like a, you can ferment your breads. So I do a lot of sourdough bread. That is my favorite way to do bread. When I teach people how to start making bread though, I uh, encourage people to start with yeast because it's so easy. It's kind of like the training wheels to making bread. And then you advance into sourdough because I feel like it can be a little finicky with feeding your sourdough starter. I have made sauerkraut, so I'll start making my sauerkraut in the fall. Um, that's kind of one of my fall things that I like to do, but that's all I have going on right now. But fermented food, oh man, that's so amazing for your microbiome, your gut, oh, digestion. Yes. <laughs> um, sourdough bread is is a is an art that's for sure um i don't know if you've made your own starter yourself uh but it's like it's a it's quite a um intense process you know it's a i i made made one um made a few um over over the last sort of few years uh do you have any kind of like secret to to yours how do you do a sourdough starter you know just the flour and water let's see i made mine oh how many four years ago now and it's, I feel like it can be, but it's kind of like, kind of like a baby. You're kind of like taking care of a baby <laughs> once you're getting it started. Um, but after you get it started and going, it's pretty easy to care for. You don't have to feed it every day. I keep mine in the fridge. I only get it out when I want to make bread. I let it warm up to room temperature and then I feed it. And then I let it uh, rise throughout the day when it's at its peak. That's when I'll use it in my recipes. But, you know, I don't, I don't think that, you know, it's extremely difficult. I would encourage people to start with yeast when they're making breads, but to try making a sourdough starter, it's just flour and water. And you just have to watch over it for, I'd say, oh, a few weeks to a month and then uh, just maintain it. Even if it completely dries out, you can still bring it back to life. They're really cool and versatile. Yeah, it's amazing like how you know, some people have had their, their starters for like 20 years sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, you're like, wow, that must be a, a pretty good one. And it's, once you get into this thing, this sort of, I guess, way of living, it, it's cool. Like you said, the whole community aspect of it, because, you know, you, you will probably ask around, Hey, does anyone have a, you know, a sourdough starter for me? And and people go, yeah, yeah, no, of course. Oh God, come, you can, you can take some and I'll, you know, you can use this and, um, then grow it yourself and stuff. And I think, I think that's also really cool with, uh, you know, like you said, with what you're doing, you know, and, and the, the sort of community, community aspect of it. Um, so have you ever made a kombucha at all? No, I have not made kombucha. I'm not the biggest fan of it. That's why I haven't made it, but I know some people who really love it. I'm more of like, I'll stick to my ferments of kefir because milk is my thing. And, and do you not think it's, like healthy is that why you don't make it or you just don't I'm, like I'm just not it's I think it's extremely great healthy it's just not for me I would say not okay cool a fan. yeah yeah no 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 worries cool because they, they've got, it's got I forget the name of it now um what is the I don't know if you you know like when you make a sort of uh, kombucha 
it forms this, I don't know what, even what to call it, but it looks something out of like an alien movie. Um, and it becomes almost effectively, it's your kind of starter. Um, but I forget, it's got a name. It's got a crazy name. Um, I've actually got one sitting in my fridge right now. Uh, I don't know. Do you, can you recall the name of it now? What, what, what the sort of starter of a kombucha is? The only thing I could think of, is it called a hooch? Because no. I know like, okay. Cause I know sourdough has like the hooch on the top. So I'm like, Oh, but yeah, I haven't dealt with kombucha very much. No, I'm going to have to, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to remember the name of that now. It's going to, it's going to annoy me a little bit <laughs> that, I, that I can't remember what it is, but it's, it's a really scary looking thing actually, once it sort of comes to life, I must say. <laughs> um, well, so, cool. so, um, you, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I love, um, is bees, right. And one of the things that I really want to kind of like get into when we eventually find our way to Portugal is, um, have our own hives and and this is something that that you've done right um mm -hmm. i i was watching a video of yours where you know you had um a whole hive that actually passed away if i'm correct and you kind of have had to transfer um the remains of it into a new hive can you just speak a little bit about beekeeping and then yeah it'd be great oh man so beekeeping is amazing so when i think of what I'm doing on my homestead, I tie it into my self-sufficiency. So bees, sugar, honey lasts indefinitely. So when I'm thinking of like, okay, this is my investment. I'm going to have a sugar storage that I can make breads, do whatever I want with this sugar. But beekeeping is so amazing. And it's, I would almost say, oh, I want to say the word easy, but some people listening who do bees might roll their eyes. But I feel like if you love it, it's going to be kind of just come naturally. Yes, there's going to be challenges. Like I did lose a hive over winter. I did have a hive swarm away this spring. And, but that's part of keeping any sort of animal you're going to learn. And I've been learning through this process, but beekeeping is so cool uh, because you just have these animals, um, these bees who are out and they're working and you watch it, watching this hive and the queen who's laying eggs and keeping the hive going and some queens are strong and some queens aren't. And oh man, beekeeping is amazing. And I would encourage anybody who is able to keep bees to do it because I think you would be surprised. It seems like a daunting task, but I would say that it's not really probably depending on the breed of bees that you have. I must say they're a very uh, sophisticated uh, animal uh, when you sort of delve into how they they work together and what they do and you know you just you just look at the the shape of the sort of the cones you know like in this like um it's like perfect like perfect symmetry and you're like how how do you little guys do that it's like pretty marvelous i think oh yeah it is and um, you, your hive got attacked, if I'm not you know wrong, like by hornets. That that's just that seems crazy. So it was actually by uh, opposing bees. So it was last fall. I was actually looking at this last night, reviewing just kind of my bee information and hives. It was last October. They were getting raided by just like another hive in the area who wanted to come and get their sugar stores. And so I had to cover them with sheets and I was actually prepping for what I will do this fall to, you know, mitigate that. So yeah, there are going to be challenges that come and you have to watch out for skunks and bears. I mean, depending on where you live. So there are some challenges and you would want to have a proper setup to avoid some of those. Wow. That's interesting. So like they almost have uh, like battles and, and is this a different type of bee that or is it the same type that comes and tries to take its sugar you know it was just like a kind of honeybee and what it was is that they had their hive already set up for the winter and so they got kind of gluttonous and they're like okay well we're gonna go and raid another hive and so my hives I guess were just on their radar and they started going in and battling so I put on an entrance reducer to make you know the hole small for them to get in and out more difficult for invading bees to come in i put on a screen i covered them with sheets to you know slow down the battle but yeah it's kind of interesting you're like man really you got these gluttonous bees out there like just let them be they're trying to like prep for the winter it's going to be tough already yeah that's so crazy um i was um 
yeah, I was also wondering, like you, you had a video where you um, bought like a new hive, or, I'm sorry, a new, what's it, I guess a new hive, yeah. And within that, there was a little like plastic capsule and that had the queen bee um, separated. How, like, how do they sort of do that? How do they um, put something like that together that you can purchase? Yeah, so there are some people who actually just like breed the queens, which is really cool. And these are going to be extremely experienced beekeepers who can just spot the queen, put her into a little container like you've seen in my videos, and then ship them off. So there's the packages. So that's the bee packages you're talking about. And then I also got the nukes, which are going to be um, established frames that are already going to have the queen and the colony on them. So there are different varieties of how you can get your hive started. But yeah, there's some people who just specialize in queens and raising queens for uh, beekeepers like me. That's amazing. Uh, what, what do you think uh, your bees have taught you? They have taught me. It's so cool because I love that you asked that because I feel like every animal here on the homestead teaches me, teaches me something different. And my bees, man, they are just hard workers and they are focused, but I love uh, their temperament. So I have carniolan bees and carniolan Italian mixes and they are just peaceful. They are peaceful. Um, and so I feel like they've taught me a sense of peace. And a lot of people are like, oh, wow, you go out there with bee gear. And sometimes I do, depending on what I'm doing in the hive. And they've just really brought a peace to the homestead. I don't know how to explain it, but I love how they go out and they just work and they are focused. They have their queen doing what she needs to do and they just go and get it done. And so that's been an inspiration for me. Like, honestly, I love going out there to just watch them. They're not getting distracted. They're communicating. They got that community going on and I love my bees. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool i think anyone that that has a, a hive definitely has a love for animals and um you definitely have much more of a connection than sort of 99 percent of the world's population to to nature um and you kind of realize like we're just sort of one little cog in this massive massive wheel and um it's really important for us to to be aware of like what other creatures do and how they do it um i was listening to something re like not recently like a long time ago actually where uh the person was saying uh you should try find 30 minutes in your day uh to spend with um an animal and that is going to be better than any sort of meditation or whatever it is that that you can do um just go like find an ant or something that's crawling on the ground and just like spend 30 minutes just with that ant, you know, and, and connecting with it. And then that's cool. That's today done. And then tomorrow go and watch like a little bird or something like that. Um, there's so much we can, we can learn from nature, isn't there? Oh yeah. I, I love it. I completely agree. The, and also the peace that you get from nature too, but there really is like, I feel like they teach you lessons and also it can just be inspired on what you need in your life at that moment and what that animal's doing. It's just cool that they have their purpose and their intuition and they know it and they just do it. So you've, you've had a cow. I know that, and it sounds like you still got cows now and, and now you have goats. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, milk for, for a moment. Um, you, 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 really um are a big advocate of of raw milk um as opposed to sort of the pasteurized stuff which like you said it's like it's sort of incinerated at a super high temperature and all the goodness is removed and then they add the synthetic goodness back into it <laughs> which is just ridiculous um can you just talk a little bit about say the benefits of raw milk so like we uh like you had just said is when you pasteurize milk you're past, you are just heating and you are killing everything in there. So raw milk has the cofactors, the proteins, the enzymes that are needed to, for example, break down lactose. Uh, it has lactase. And so in this pasteurized milk that you're getting, I mean, that's been obliterated. So no wonder so many people are lactose intolerant because they don't have those necessary enzymes that are going to help their body break down lactose. And instead you go to the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, we'll just go get some lactate, which adds back in, you know, the enzyme that raw milk has. And 
when I when I'm thinking about this and raw milk, I think of these patterns of like, well, we know the system and big pharma, the FDA, they don't have uh, our health in um, their interest at all. We need we need to have that. And so that's something with raw milk. You go and you actually look at the statistics and uh, how many people get sick from like vegetables, getting E. coli from vegetables. Well, it's more than raw milk. And so raw milk just has all these necessary things that it also has um, the, like I was saying, the necessary cofactors and proteins and bacteria that are going to take care of that bad bacteria already. You don't need pasteurization to take care of it. And why pasteurization became a thing is because there were these filthy dairies back in the day that their filthy practices probably keep keeping sick animals, not tending to them, you know, just filthy areas. And it was making people sick. And I totally get that. But instead of cleaning up the dairies, they were like, hey, let's just pasteurize the milk, you know, because that's the cheaper option. And you can, and people say, well, you couldn't have raw milk and transport it. Yes, you can. And there actually um, was a farm who was doing that. And so just thinking about raw milk, I'm such a huge advocate for it. And when you think about it, uh, you you can go to the store and you can go and get like, skittles or honeycomb cereal and give it to your kids but but i can't give my kid you know it's illegal somewhere to go and get raw milk like you got to think about that but when you look up raw milk there's all this propaganda that's going to scare you but why why aren't you being scared of the dyes that are in skittles the chemicals that are in the cereals that you're giving your kids like it's it's just crazy to me it's completely backwards so huge advocate for raw milk go get some raw milk <laughs> Uh, my wife and I uh, recently found a, a lady down the road who uh, does uh, raw goat milk. And um, yeah, that's what we get now. Um, and it's it's great. Like it's, I mean, you know, the, the taste is obviously quite different to to cow's milk, but you, you quickly kind of adjust. And um, it's it almost feels lighter than, than cow's milk as well. Oh, yes, I completely agree with you. And also, so I had my cow... Um, and I've had a lot of different cow raw milk from farms around me. And what's so interesting is each animal is going to kind of have a different flavor per se. And I get asked this question like, oh, what does it taste like? Do you like cow or goat milk better? I actually prefer goat milk because I feel like goat milk is like you're saying lighter. I feel like it's smoother. Um, it's naturally homogenized. And um, it doesn't have as strong of a flavor as cow milk to me. If I let it sit for a few days in the fridge, it will develop a strong flavor. But yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Can you make kefir out of goat's milk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I did is I had uh, already a kefir starter that was accustomed to raw cow milk. And uh, I just started adding in a little bit of goat milk each day, and eventually it got used to the goat milk. And now I just do pure goat milk and with my kefir grains, and it makes goat milk kefir. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Something that uh, it, it's so fascinating, right? Once you once you start learning about things, like you you really understand the sort of the complexity of of things, right? So. Um, just a, a little story here. Uh, my, my sister and I, quite a few years ago, we were uh, wanting to start uh, an egg white business, right? So just selling egg whites, um, because back in South Africa, it was it was a big thing, you know, especially for people that were, that trained and all these sort of things. You know, it was like, oh, egg whites full of protein and blah blah. <laughs> now I would be eat the whole egg sort of thing, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so we went um, and we did a lot of research about it and met with, uh, you know, people from different farms and industry and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, things I, I had no clue about was like, okay, you actually have chickens that uh, lay um, eggs um, only for, you know, for people to eat. Then you have uh, chickens that are only for people to eat, you know, like that you don't really get a like a hybrid, or well, I think you meant, I think you, you said, you do say there is a hybrid where you can eat them and eat their eggs, but it was just like really interesting. So the, the eggs that were in South Africa, right. Uh, that people ate and they were on our shelves in South Africa, they were actually originally grown in Germany. And, um, there was like almost five kind of like, um, iterations slash generations of uh, breeding 
Um, so like the, 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 they had whichever chickens for the eggs and then, then they would, those ones would, um, lay more eggs and then they would then, they would repeat that cycle like five times or something. And then those babies, they were then flown to South Africa and they were like, okay, cool. These are the chickens we're now going to use for, for eggs in South Africa. And, um, it was like such a complex thing. And I was like, wow, just for, just for eggs, they have this really sort of, uh, like complex process. Um, but it's just, it's just really interesting. And and I was watching something of yours where, uh, you were saying there's like, there's different like colors of eggs, like blue eggs and all these different things. I mean, can you just talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah. So I recently have my Americana chicken. She's laying blue eggs. And I did post that. I actually, I would, I got so many questions asking about the blue egg and it's, interesting this kind of goes into a disconnect with our food right so we don't see where you know the the eggs at the store where they're coming from and like you were saying that something in Germany and then to South Africa so you have all these different kinds of breeds of chickens who are going to give you different colors of eggs just depending on their breed and what they make and some chickens even lay pink eggs so cool but what's so interesting is the mass egg you know, production, it's probably going to be a certain breed of chickens that are just huge egg layers. Um, the probably the white chicken, the layern, which I have a few of them, and yeah, they just blast out eggs. And so what that's what you're going to see at the store is the white eggs or the brown eggs. And then there's all the different kinds of cage free and whatnot, you're never going to see those cool blue eggs or the blush eggs or the green eggs unless you go to a farmer's market, or you're getting your eggs locally. But yeah, there's all these different varieties. And like you were saying, there's the egg producers, there's the dual purpose for meat and eggs, and then there's just meat birds that all have their purpose based on what you want for your homestead. Mm. It's very, very fascinating, I must say. Um, one of the, one of the other things that you, you, you had to do is like grow, uh, I guess a garden and you have these raised beds, um, which is, which is really interesting. I wanted to find out like, why do you have to raise beds and not just plant directly into the, the ground that you have? So for me, that's twofold. One, it I love my raised beds just for the convenience of I don't have to get on the ground and like reach over. So that's kind of what would that be a champagne problem of not having to go to the ground, but also weed management. So I actually did experiment this year and just tilled some of the soil back and planted some stuff. But and I was just out there all the time, just weeding, weeding, weeding. It was where I did my watermelons. Versus when I have a raised bed, it's way easier to maintain. So if you think about it, um, if you just build that raised bed, you put the soil in it, you have to be careful to, or be aware to just maintain that soil, build it up as you plant things. But it's more of just like a convenience. I love, love, love my raised beds. And I definitely prefer them over the ground, but you can just do ground, but I just feel like it's easier maintenance. And there's something really interesting as well about, um, I think you said indoor soil versus, uh, or indoor seeds and using a specific type of soil, um, for, uh, for things that you grow indoors, as opposed to seeds that you would sow outdoors. Um, yeah, what, what are the things there that you need to know about? Yeah, so there are a bunch of different uh, kinds of soils that you can get. And usually that's going to come around in springtime or around your growing season in your area. And you can go to the store and you can get organic soils. And there's special like um, seed starting soils that are going to have different kinds of nutrients for your seeds versus um, some seeds can be sown directly outdoors. But again, you have to keep in mind um, if you are sowing seeds directly outdoors, you're going to have to do the weed mitigation. And um, that's really what I ran into was the weeds and constantly having to go out. Whereas this soil that you're getting from the store, the seed starting soil, um, it's going to be the weed free and you're not going to have to worry about that. And you can put it under the grow lights and just, you know, be fine. You don't have to go and weed it. Um, you can also make your own seed starting soil. Uh, from outside soil, but you would want to heat it to kill um, anything in there that could be hazardous to seeds. 
I prefer not to do that because I feel like it's, I've done it once. It's like a hassle bringing the soil in and heating it in your oven and you get soil everywhere and it's kind of a mess. So I like to, um, actually this goes to another local uh, community thing. You can source local soil from people who specialize in making soil or um, that's what I would recommend people to do. I would avoid any sort of seed starting or soil from the store that's just general and it's not organic uh, because you're going to run into, you know, those chemical issues and what's in your soil is going to go into your plant and then that plant's going to give you food and ultimately it's going to end up in you. And with the plants that you grow, uh, which I mean, obviously like veggies, fruits, herbs, these sort of things, uh, my wife, her grandmother always used to say like half is for you and half is for nature or like half is for the insects. That's just kind of <laughs> the reality of what happens. Um, has that kind of been your experience? Yeah. So right now I have apples coming in, just an abundance of apples. And you can see where like, you know, the worms have gone in and all that. Um, but like, um, I have, uh, been, like I have found is I live in just this really just God blessed pocket where my pests are not really eliminating my garden, but that also comes in with crop rotation and being mindful of where you're planting things. So I haven't really ran into that in my gardening years here, which I'm grateful for. Mostly it's been, uh, some of it's had to go into the chickens because the chickens have figured out to get how they got into my garden and then chickens will just destroy your garden. So it's been more to the chickens than bugs. <laughs> Classic. Um, and what about like water? I mean, water is generally the water in our taps and our system is not great. Uh, do you have any sort of um, ways of getting around that and using, I guess, more healthy water? So one thing that I invested in when I was in, on city water, which is going to be that fluoride, chlorine water, is I got a Berkey filter and I really did a lot of research on this type of filter. And it has these uh, Berkey patented filters that take out, you know, all of the gunk, I would say, just absolute gunk that is added in which I think makes more pe people docile. But anyways, um, I invested in a high quality filter. If you get like a Brita filter, or like a cheap filter from the store, it's, it's not going to take out that fluoride. It's not, it's really not going to do anything for you. But the Berkey filter that I invested in when I was living in the city kept all the minerals in, but took all the mind control gunk out. <laughs> but now I am on my own well, I've had it tested. And so I feel very fortunate for that. Um, but that is also something that would tie into your food storage, right? Because you need to have water in your food storage. You want to have quality water. So I would suggest people, you know, source out where are your sources of water around you? Um, that's, that's where I'm at with water. What an interesting subject there is. Yeah. I can't believe the some of the stuff that's put into our water. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and water is a, just a fascinating subject as well within itself. Like you just kind of the more you kind of go down rabbit holes and stuff, the more you're like, wow, this is quite an amazing um, substance, that's for sure. Um, so, but what about, so, so like the, the water that you sort of put on your, um, you know, your vegetables and your, your fruits and your, and your gardens, what do you use for that? So that comes straight from my well. I have these frost-free hydrants around my garden that I will hook up a hose to, and then I'll just run. I also have like, uh, you know, irrigation that you can do, but my garden has not been that, um, I've been very fortunate with rain. So I've been extremely fortunate with that. My main thing that is soaking up most of my water right now is my orchard. I planted 10 fruit trees, a variety of peach, pear, apple, um, I think let's see, peach, pear, and apple and cherry trees. So I have been extremely diligent in making sure that they are watered. I actually have that going right now. So that comes from my well. And like you're saying, yeah, I feel like you would want to be thoughtful of what kind of water you are giving your plants. If I had an option, I would, if I lived in the city, I would filter my water first before giving it to my plants, if that was a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure many people would would take as much care <laughs> as yeah. you um for with their plants, but um but it's something for for people to definitely be very conscious of. I was wondering, like, what have been your biggest challenges uh, running your own 
own farm? Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest challenge is, <laughs> I feel like time management, because there are so many things that need to be done. And the biggest challenge is also, I, now that I'm thinking about it, is there's always something that I feel like goes wrong. Like two weeks ago, I had a hydrant go out and there's just all these constant things with running your farm, like the animals are getting out. You got to source hay for your animals for the winter. You got to plan for that. You got to make sure they have shelter. You got to make sure they are fed. But I feel like my biggest ones is there's just always kind of something happening and I got to deal with it on top of, you know, taking care of the animals in my garden and making sure everything's getting water. Uh, so time management plus being able to be prepared for when my water went out or uh, my heating, I just heat my house with wood heat. Uh, so just there's all these just moving components, I would say, when you have your own farm and you're raising your animals and you got to make sure your animals don't die. They have to have water. They have to have shelter. They have to have food. Do you have enough food if there was an emergency and you couldn't leave your house for whatever reason? So I would say just all the moving parts and keeping on top of it. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, even maintenance and stuff like that, it must just be like, oh my word, um, I've got to fix this shed and this fence and and everything. Like, And these are time, time consuming things to do. Yes, extremely time consuming. I have been out rotating, grazing the goats. And so I was pounding in my own fence and that was taking a while. And then last year, my garden got ravaged by deer and so had to get a fence up for that and plan for that and uh ex actually was going to have an excavator come because i still have things going on with my water lines and i got to get that fixed and yeah so there's just a lot going on yeah and and i don't think you you necessarily make it easy for yourself you you spoke about time management um obviously you got this huge farm uh then you you know you also actually um live stream game games every weekday by the sounds of it um you you've got to produce like um your youtube videos and um upload those and edit them and then your your website and everything i was just like like where do you actually find the time to do all this stuff <laughs> Well, so that, that falls into, you know, you wake up early and then as I'm going throughout my day, that's going to be a majority of my content. And then I do stream games Monday through Friday on the Twitch TV, Gubba TV. So that's a whole nother brand that I have. And that's where I started eight years ago. And then, so I'm just already kind of into that content production and have been for eight years. So now that I'm doing the farm, it's, more easy for me to integrate it. Whereas if I just started a farm and was just getting into content, I don't think I could do it. Uh, it would be extremely difficult to upkeep the website, the social media while on top of gaming and having a whole other brand that I'm managing. I couldn't even imagine that because I have all this knowledge now of how to do both. And yeah, that would be almost impossible. I must say it is really impressive uh, that you that you manage all of that. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I was just wondering, like you, it's almost like these sort of polar opposite worlds, right? That it's it sounds like you you you, you know you have a gaming world and a brand that you run there, and then you have a um, this homesteading um, other sort of brand and and world that you you know you obviously spend time in both of them but they they're almost like polar opposites you know you wouldn't really associate a gamer with somebody who runs her own farm like that kind of says a lot about you as a person though you know in terms of how balanced well-rounded and um, interesting you are hey i i appreciate that and you're right it definitely is polar opposites but what i've experienced too is so I've been streaming games for eight years and just, I have this most amazing community. We've been talking about community, just this so cool community that I just love with my whole heart. And they've, you know, come over to the homestead with me and they've been learning. And there was somebody in my chat who's telling me they're buying raw milk now and they're getting local honey because I've been talking about it. And so there is this interesting aspect that I kind of want to start taking my homestead and doing more streaming with it because I feel like, kind of goes back to that inspiration thing. I love being able to share this and I don't feel like there is that out there with live streaming as much. Mm. Sounds like a great idea actually now that you say it. And I think, um, yeah, the, the more you can help, I guess, people in that world, 
um yeah well it's it's just it's just really cool i think it's so so interesting like that um you don't fit in this sort of bucket at all you know what i mean you like you you just got you know two very different worlds so i think that is a lot about a person um one of the things that i think is really important for us as humans to do is kind of i guess learn from each other but also learn from other people's mistakes um what is some advice that you would give somebody who is looking to go it you know on their own and and might have a piece of land that they that they want to sort of start cultivating um what are some of the maybe the mistakes that you made and and, and at the same time what is like the you know a few bits of advice that you could offer people I would say my biggest advice is to not get in over your head because it's going to, if you got that piece of land and you're looking into homesteading, everything's going to be exciting. The cows, the goats, pigs, you know, all these animals on top of growing your own food or maybe building your own structures. That is the biggest mistake I made when I came into the, the land. I just was completely in over my head. I got a dairy cow and that was quite the experience, but wow, I learned that cows are maybe not for me and um, just dealing with the fencing and a lot of people say goats are harder to maintain, but in my experience, they're not. And then on top of that, I was trying to grow a garden. I was figuring out what to do with my content and having to do, you know, those things like fencing and, you know, uh, maintaining the property and getting ready for winter. So I would say really just like take one task, say you want chickens, just focus on chickens for a little bit. Do not do it all at once because you will quickly drown and then you're going to hate something that maybe you would have loved if you would have just focused on that. So I would say just bite it off in chunks and just take time on one thing. You don't need to do everything at once. Yeah, that's great advice. And um, in terms of like planning, I always think like it's important to plan sort of before you do something, almost before you do anything, you know, it's, it saves you a lot of time in the long run. Uh, what sort of planning did, did you do before you ventured into all of this, like in terms of say research and I don't know, like building things, did you, did you have a plan? You know, that kind of goes into with me being over my head. Cause I kind of came into it and I'm like, I'm going to do everything. And that's kind of what I did. I did move in in winter. So it gave me some time to prep because over winter, you're not doing much. But once spring came around, I got that cow right away. I started on my garden right away and didn't realize how much of a deer problem I was going to have. But there was also like other things I need to do in my house that I had to get reconstructed. Um, so I do think that planning is so important. And that was a huge part of why I was so in over my head, because I just kind of went for all of it at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cheapers, <laughs> yeah. uh, definitely making your life uh, life difficult, eh? Um, so, Gabba, um, as we kind of like sort of start to to finish it off, uh, a, a question I like to uh, ask um, all my guests um, is: What are two books that have changed kind of like your your worldview, effectively, or, or just really helped you in life? You know, so. The one that I'm thinking of right now that I most recently read is the Brothers Karamazov. Have, I don't, you're nodding. Have you read it before? So in there, there's the part called the Grand Inquisitor. And uh, that changed my perspective on how I kind of view the world right now. It talked about the three questions that Jesus Christ got asked in the wilderness by uh, the great tempter. And it just gave me a different view on how the world operates. So I'm not quite sure that really ties into homesteading, but that just had such a profound aspect, a profound effect on me that I called my family and I read it to my mom over the phone because it was uh, so monumental for me. And I'm also thinking of, man, my mind doesn't even really go to homestead books per se. I, you know, I have all these gardening books and everything, but another book that really changed my aspect on life is The Count of Monte Cristo. I, so I, it's kind of these fictional books that kind of made me reflect on my life and um, Count of Monte Cristo with how to carry myself and, you know, not holding on to vengeance or things in my heart and kind of going about 
of life with a light heart and not focusing on things that might bring me down and just more focusing on good. So those two books, like I have such a passion for and I reread them because they've helped me as a person. So those are amazing books. And uh, I haven't heard of the second one, but uh, I'm definitely and adding it to my to my list. So so thanks a lot. You, you're quite shocked that I haven't. Is it a classic? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, it is a classic. And I remember when I was younger, my dad recommended it to me and he said, this will, this will change your life. And I didn't understand. I didn't understand. I read it at the time and I was like, oh, you know, a teenager reading it. And then I went back through it years later and I was like, oh, I, I see what my dad was saying. So there's wisdom, ancestral wisdom. And that's cool. I remember my dad, actually, he gave me a book called uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I was super young, right? And I was like, mm, I, I didn't really get it, you know. But now, like you look at like a lot of the sort of classics that help people in the day. And, and a lot of the time that book is mentioned. And I'm like, mm, my dad was also onto something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, it's, that's a book that I, that I need to go back and, and reread, actually. Uh, so, uh, Gabba, I was just wondering, um, where can like um, people sort of get in touch with you? Uh, follow you um, and then also like what are you kind of most excited about uh, about the future so the best way to find me is gubbahomestead.com and then all my socials for our gubba homestead but I also stream on twitch tv gubba tv so that's my other brand is gubba tv you can find me on socials there and then regards to the future I just I'm just so looking forward to becoming more self-sufficient, you know, building up my food storage even more, even though I feel like it's pretty solid, but just learning more of those ancestral skills that my great grandparents had and how they cultivated things and how they raised animals. That's really what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to learning more and hopefully inspiring people along the way. That's super cool. And my last question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think being ridiculously human means to me is uh, just being yourself. I feel like so many people are just afraid to be themselves. They're afraid to be judged. But I sit and think about that. And I think I've even talked about it on social media is like, you just got to be you. Because if you're sitting there and you're, you are somebody else here and somebody else, you know, at home, like you're not being true to yourself. So I think being ridiculously human is just being yourself and not having any shame. But also at the same time, like trying to be the best version of yourself. That's what I think. Yeah, that's really great. I, and I totally agree. Um, it definitely comes across with the way that you are like, uh, you know, chatting to you now and, and in your videos. Um, uh, it reminds me of what you said. Um, uh, Tim Ferriss recently wrote something about something like 99% of people are just fearful or, uh, in general, you know, and uh, fearful to to go things alone, fearful to kind of start their own businesses, fearful to almost be themselves. And it's kind of, it's kind of a little bit sad how we we almost exist like that uh, collectively as a as a society. Uh, so what you said um, is important. You know, we should definitely encourage people to just be themselves that little bit more um, and that bit more genuine, and uh, that will help with our our connection. I think. Um, so so yeah, thanks a lot for that. I just wanted to. To say thanks so much, uh, Gabba, for for coming on the on the podcast. Uh, you you really are just such a light. Seriously, um, what a what a great young lady. Um, what you're doing is really really fantastic. It's inspiring. Um, it's motivating. It's uh, you sharing so much like value um, and knowledge. Like uh, it's it's really silly for people not to um, go and check out everything that you're doing because it's um you know it's like you're almost you almost have your own little education center on with your YouTube and your, uh, your, um, your, te your Instagram and, and Twitter and stuff. So, so, you know, thanks so much for that. Um, thanks for, yeah, just being like a smiley, positive, cool, energetic person. And I, I just wish you the best of luck, seriously, in everything that you're doing. And I'm just looking forward to carrying on following you on, on your journey. Hey, thank you. And thanks for giving me like a platform to come on and talk. It's been really just awesome to engage with somebody who gets it, understands and has that same passion to like share it with others. Cause I feel like there's so much power in that. Thank you. My pleasure.